We're now in public session um, and a couple of notices to colleagues and visitors. If you have a mobile phone, could you either switch them off or to flight mode? Um, apart from disrupting the meeting, the meeting is recorded and uh, broadcast and it interferes. So if you have a mobile phone or a 3G or 4G device, if you could turn them off. And also then, in relation to the witnesses, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue so, to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. The opening statement you've submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing practice, parliamentary practice, to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So good afternoon and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Tiglin Challenge, represented this afternoon by Mr Aubrey McCarthy, Mr Phil Thompson and Mr Niall Murphy. Uh, your full submission has been received and has been circulated to members and, as I indicated earlier, will be uh, on the web committee's website afterwards. Um, Mr McCarthy, I understand you're going to do an opening statement and a summary for the committee, and from that I'll invite colleagues uh, to ask a number of questions. And feel free with your colleagues if they want to uh, and entered the discussion at any stage, they're more than welcome to. Thank you. Uh, Chairman and members of the Housing and Homeless Committee, on behalf of the Board of Tiglin and on my own behalf, uh, I wish to express, first of all, our appreciation for inviting us here uh, to meet with you today. Uh, as you know, as um, the Chair has already mentioned, I'm accompanied by our CEO, uh, Mr Philip Thompson, the CEO of Tiglin, and also uh, a former service user, uh, Mr Niall Murphy. Um, the board and management of Tiglin uh, very much welcome the work that this committee is doing and I personally have been following it on the Oroctus uh, TV and it is encouraging just to see. Um, I want to first point out at the very outset that Tiglin deals with a particular cohort uh, of the homeless population. We operate homeless cafes, uh, they're called outreach cafes, called a no-box cafe. Uh, some of you I know are aware of our work, um, but you would have seen these around town. They're big green coaches and they're converted into a cafe restaurant type of idea. Um, it, Monday it's in Dunleary, Tuesday in Ballymun, Wednesday Bray, Thursday and Friday um, are the nights I drive and they're in O'Connell Street right beside the Spire. It's interesting to point out that 78% of uh, service users who present to the No Box Cafe and also to our walking teams who go throughout the city, 78% of these people are in some form of addiction. So with our clients it seems that homelessness and addiction, they go hand in hand. Sometimes homelessness can bring about addiction and sometimes addiction can bring about homelessness. It is also interesting that the times that the cafes go out will be in evenings. So you're dealing with a cohort of people who haven't been catered for, perhaps rough sleepers, etc. Tiglin also operates residential centres for both men and women. We have a residential centre for men in Tiglin, Ashford, County Wicklow, but we also have a women's centre, and that's in British Bay. 72%, that's three out of four, of the Tiglin residents have experienced homelessness during their addiction. So when a person we meet in the street um, goes through detox, is, is referred in through um, various referrals, which our CEO will explain later, comes into the centre, we put them through a fairly rigorous 14-module uh, programme, which, which uh, the longevity is fairly important here. And um, it's all in... Tiglin, which is up in the Wicklow Mountains, so it's a special place. And then we have a step-down approach, which includes transitional housing. Peter McVerry and other campaigners uh, have voiced for years that it is widely accepted 
uh, fact that rehabilitation will solve the addiction problems of individuals. And we know from listening to the people that have uh, presented here that housing is an obvious way to solve the homeless problem. However, for those who, whose addiction has bound them into homelessness, then residential rehabilitation becomes a very necessary and successful exit pathway uh, for, for the people in homelessness as it addresses the areas that tied them to a homeless lifestyle. While everyone that is homeless, and let me make this very clear, while everyone that is homeless is clearly not in addiction, and residential treatment is not necessary for every person in addiction, we have found at Tiglin that when a service user, user is bound by both homelessness and addiction, then the best way to solve this is through residential rehabilitation care. It is essential that this cohort of people, they need to be removed from their surroundings to attain a chance of getting clean and sober. Our experience has shown that the longer you keep the individual that's homeless and addicted, the longest, longer that you keep them engaged, then the better the outcome. Now, from the outset, Tiglin are not out to solve the homeless problem, but what we are interested in doing is helping those people that do come to us for our service. Motivation, determination and people who take, take an interest in you and believe in you are just a few of the many factors that are stimuli for entering into a sober life. But imagine being without a security of a home, without family, perhaps in poor health, and perhaps have a scarred history due to your addiction. How would your determination hold up? And the people we deal with um, every night of the week, not knowing where they're going to sleep tonight, will they be safe? Will they make their methadone appointment uh, in the morning? Will they overdose on their next hit? Could you imagine what would inspire their motivation? As I've been seeing with your own committee over the last number of weeks, um, homelessness has changed in recent years. And I'm aware that there are many people, as I've mentioned, who are homeless and have nothing to do with addiction. But your committee has been established because the situation has reached crisis point. I know the hotels, bed and breakfast, etc., have been filled because of this great need. And many of these people who are using these services work and have a good social structure around them, but because of the rising rental market, it has priced them out and the supply has not met uh, demand. But if you could imagine then how the doubly disadvantaged are in this situation, and when I mean doubly disadvantaged, I'm talking about people who are homeless and also have some form of life controlling problem or addiction. While they are entitled to rent allowance, the obvious ravages of addiction and life on the streets is often clear to a landlord, and they are met with many excuses that we're not going to uh, receive a tenancy. So there are some who will obtain uh, sobriety by an active care plan being put in place, providing housing, tenancy support, outpatient, uh, day service rehabilitation. But for the vast majority who are homeless and chronically addicted, we believe strongly that they need inpatient residential support options. They need to be removed from their surrounding and live in a sober community where professional skills such as counselling, therapy, medical interventions, these are addressed and then educational opportunities explored. I'm hoping that some of you will be able to uh, talk to Niall after my presentation and you'll be able to see what actually worked for him. But in Tiglin's experience, the great work of residential rehabilitation hinges on two main factors. One is that the person is properly prepared for drug-free rehabilitation. And the second one is that after the residential rehabilitation, after that's completed, that the residential aftercare is there to aid the person step back into everyday living. And as part of that, we also do, uh, we supply transitional housing. A full wraparound service for two years, we believe that that is needed in many of these situations in order to successfully exit homelessness and addiction. And this is exactly what we do at Tiglin. Tiglin is seeing people successfully exit homelessness through long-term rehabilitation and support housing post-treatment. At the moment, we partner with Wicklow County Council uh, with a house in Arklow. And this is a transitional house for people that come from any accredited uh, re residential rehab. And it gives them a transitional house so that they can get a step back um, into a sober lifestyle. We also have transitional housing for 35 individuals in Greystones, which works very well. Uh, regarding the residential rehab, we have 30 male beds and 12 female beds. 
Chair and committee members, I'd, I'd like to point out, um, when I was preparing this presentation, I was thinking of people who I could bring, and I actually wrote down names, and I came up with just 140 names, which is phenomenal, and it's brilliant to be able to say it, of people, individuals, so you're, Niall is the lucky one here today, of individuals who have been homeless and in chaotic addiction, but are now back in jobs, education, housing, and they have found lives beyond addiction and beyond homelessness. One such example, as I mentioned, Niall is here with me today. Niall has been housed many times due to his homelessness, but it was only when his addiction was finally addressed that his housing needs were then catered for. Niall is now back in work, he's completed his education, he's got a good job, he's paying taxes, he recently got married, which is more of a success than me at the moment, and he's obtained a mortgage for a new house. So, so I hope that you'll be able to sense something of Niall uh, when, he, when he talks to you. So the solution I have, uh, I think it's very simple, and I believe as a committee, I'd hope you'll take this on board. I believe the housing allowance that the homeless person, Niall or others, is entitled to, I believe that that should be used in the rehabilitation treatment of that individual. Entitlements before treatment are not the same as entitlements during treatment. And I believe this proposal is for people who have an entitlement. I'm not talking about if, if, their, if their partner is using that entitlement, well then they don't have an entitlement. But I'm talking about people who have an entitlement but are not able to access that entitlement for the duration of the treatment. Um, in other words, they don't have the capacity to use it. Well, I believe residential rehabs can be used and give them the capacity to use it. And if we do this, well, then we have a fighting chance of solving the homeless situation and the addiction situation for that person. I'm, I'm delighted to say uh, that 78% of people who have exited Tiglin are sober today and are either working in education, on CE schemes, etc. But Tiglin alongside Merchantsky, Francis Farm, Cool Mine, all these places do not qualify to accept rent allowance because they're classed as rehabilitation institutions. So if Niall Murphy, who is homeless and is in addiction and is entitled to rent allowance, um, sorry, I've got to lose my way here. If he's entitled to rent allowance and he wishes to uh, come into the likes of Tiglin or any other rehab centre, well then he's not entitled to it anymore and he loses that entitlement. And the Tig Lin staff, in our case, have to go out bagpacking, uh, do marathons or do whatever to fundraise for, for Niall's residential treatment, which in effect is, is, is rather unfair. So it was clear at the time when Niall came in, and he'll share with you himself, that he did not have the skills to take a home off the state, but he was given it. He was given housing by the state, but he wasn't able to uh, keep that housing because his own addiction uh, came first. So someone to, who has an entitlement to a home, but he has no home, basically. They get the money to stay in a hotel, but if they go into a treatment centre, they do not get the money. Okay? So I'm thinking, is it realistic that a rehab voluntary, voluntarily gives accommodation for a person for up to a year without state support? And I believe, Chairman, the solution is clear, that we allow the individual use that housing allowance, whatever it is, which is their entitlement, and I believe they use that for the residential treatment. And I don't mean just for Tiglin, I mean for accredited rehabilitation residential centres. This will cost the state not one cent extra, and I believe it will give uh, with us a 78 chance of turning around this individual's life so that homelessness and addiction are no longer an issue for that person. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you Mr McCarthy. If the committee would bear with us, I think at this stage maybe we give uh, Niall Murphy an opportunity. Uh, while we have it in, tra in, the, in the text, I think members would be interested to hear from you. So if you'd like to tell your story, please, and then we'll take questions. Okay, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> basically, um, I fell into drug addiction when I was about 26. Um, um, in the 90s, there was a rave scene in Dublin, and, and um, I got caught up in that. And I found that gradually over the years, um, the addiction turned very ugly and, and I, I tried to stop and I couldn't um, um, and the, the drug addiction progressed into harder drugs like cocaine, heroin um, um, and eventually I was living in a house in Crumlin with three people and because of my addiction um, there was a lot of antisocial behaviour and um, I was shoplifting from a local supermarket um, there was people finding syringes in the house and the landlord found out about it and he 
kicked me out in the street. So that, that was where my homelessness started. Um, and uh, obviously when I got homeless, things got a lot more chaotic. Um, during those um, years of homelessness, um, I lived in homeless shelters uh, and suffered many near fatal overdoses. Um, I think I remember at least six times being rushed to hospital in, 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 in an ambulance. Um, and um, there, there was a local uh, place called Focus Ireland that helps homeless people. Um, on a couple of occasions I went in there and I, they had a sheet of landlords who would accept rent allowance. Um, and I got lucky at one stage and I did get a place uh, in Terra Nure, like a small little bed set. Um, I lasted about five weeks there because the, the root issue wasn't being dealt with. Um, I was still using drugs um, and it got to a stage where I couldn't pay my rent and I ended up homeless again. Um, that happened to me again, um, maybe a year later. I got a place in Ratgar and uh, I lasted probably about the same amount of time, maybe four to five weeks, uh, and ended up homeless again. So um, eventually uh, I, I heard about the Tiglin program, I think that was in 2008. Um, I went into Tiglin, did the 16 month program. And when I got to the end of Tiglin, they provided me with an aftercare house where I lived for two years. Um, after that, I, I moved back into living in society like, privately. I went to college for two years in UCD and I uh, got married and today I have a mortgage. Um, and the reason why I have that is because uh, I went through treatment. I couldn't get out of homelessness until I addressed my addiction problem. Um, I did that in Tiglin and Today, everything is different. Everything is completely changed. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Nile, for that. Um, and I, I suppose you're to be complimented on it, you know the success story. And uh, I suppose those in Tiglin who worked who worked with you, um, it's, it's very encouraging to hear. Uh, the first deputy who has indicated they want to speak, Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I want to um, welcome and congratulate our visitors for, for uh, their, their visitation here and for their address. Uh, it is clear, uh, Mr Chairman, that they have a thorough knowledge of the subject matter with which they deal and which all of us have to deal with on a weekly basis and daily basis. And they have an understanding of it uh, that by virtue of dealing with it, that is, is, is exemplary. So I, I want to first of all congratulate you for the way in which you approach it. For a, a number of questions. Quickly, do you have approved housing uh, status? Uh, as you know, Chairman, I'm not a particular friend of uh, the approved housing groups. Uh, 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 because I have always held the view that they were the cause of the. No, just to, 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 to repeat it. Uh, I, but I, I'm a strong supporter of the, of, the, of, the, of, of the kind of support that is being provided to Tiglin. Uh, because uh, the homelessness situation, this, this rough sleepers, cannot be resolved by just providing an emergency bed for one night at a time. There must be some continuity and you, you, you've proven that. So can I ask, to what extent do you get to a situation uh, where, and I know you have got this, where you cannot cope with the number of inquiries and how have you, have you assessed that uh, and, and have you quantified the, 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 the need in the future? And the next point, I think, is the uh, degree to which you can um, uh, outsource uh, in, with, through housing associations or whatever, or the, lo or the local authority. The kind of person who doesn't need the ongoing treatment, who doesn't need the residential care treatment on a 24-7 basis, and who, who has got to the situation where they can, they can survive uh, with supervision, but not necessarily in-house supervision. How, how, how have you managed that, and how do you propose to manage? And the last point, I think is in relation to uh, the manner in which you make contact. Uh, for example, as we've, well, well I've said anyway, Chairman, not everybody agrees with me on this, that, that the, 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 this type of body is uniquely suited to dealing with a specific niche in the market. Not the whole housing requirements at all, but the niche in the market that the local authorities cannot deal 